hello and welcome to Sentient Media's Animal Humans, uh, where we're meeting people who are changing the way we think about and interact with animals and the living world around us. So musicians and creators of the new documentary Highway to Health, Tanya O'Callaghan and Derek Green, although I think it was mainly Tanya nominated today's guest. Um, I'm particularly excited to introduce Damien Manda, aka the vegan sniper. Um, and I think it's fair to say that Damien's backstory is pretty well known at this point, um, but for those who don't know, very briefly, Damien's an Iraq war veteran who served as a naval clearance diver and a special ops sniper. Uh, now he's the founder of the International Anti-Poaching Foundation, um, which started in 2009 in Zimbabwe, uh, and since then has grown, I believe, to over 200 staff uh, in five countries. And in December 2020, they just raised one million dollars. Um, so the team operate on the front lines with a completely female ranger team who you can see in action uh, in the beautiful National Geographic document documentary um, Akashinga, uh, which translates as the brave ones. Um, so yeah, Damien, thank you so much for joining us today. Cool, mate. Thank you for having us, Anna. Thanks, Tanya, for the nomination. <laughs> Promise we won't make it too painful. Um, so first Bring of all, um, <laughs> I'm just super curious, like right off the bat, uh, I have so many pictures of what like a, a day in your life might look like. Like, is, is there a typical day for you? Like you wake up in the morning and you do a run and save a rhino? Like, what does it look like? Yeah, uh, look, look, I wear, wear a bunch of hats, hey, in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I mean, we've built such an amazing team over the last 12 years. So I'm able to sort of come up to 30,000 feet and, and really look at, at uh, the organisation from a strategic uh, a strategic level and, and where we're going and, and not get caught down in the weeds too much. Uh, uh, you know, at the moment I'm visiting uh, our project here in Kenya, uh, Lead Ranger, which is training uh, of Indigenous leaders uh, from uh, leading uh, organisations both in the public and private sector so they can go out and, and become their own instructors within their own organisations. So that, uh, you know, it's, it's one of two main projects we do, the other one being Akashinga, uh, which is uh, large landscape management, uh, uh, deploying women as, as the, the primary method of, of law enforcement and community development. Uh, so... Uh, you know, I, I lecture for National Geographic. Um, so, in a, in a normal world, uh, when 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 travel is is uh, is happening, you know, I'm usually doing uh, one or two tours a year for Nat Geo. Um, also, doing our own own public speaking, our own fundraising. Uh, probably spend up to three months a year in the States, a month a year in Europe, uh, a month in Australia, where I'm from, and all of that's gone to shit at the moment. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here in Africa, but um, I don't. Uh, I suppose the only routine I, I keep each day is uh, my, my two weapons of choice, uh, a steering wheel and, uh, and, a, and a keyboard, um, which is uh, what my life has become these days. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of admin and a lot of correspondence, but um, yeah, I just, um, you yeah, know, I, I, don't, uh, I don't, don't hold too fast to, to routine, which may, sound, which may sound horrifying to some people out there who run a very regimented uh, uh, organisation, but as a CEO, this is what works for me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think right now a lot of people can uh, like find comfort in that you also don't have a routine because I think most people's routines have been thrown out the window with COVID anyway. Um, everything's changed, right? Yeah. Um, I'm curious about establishing um, what the world of poaching looks like now and if it's changed uh, since the lockdowns and since people became more aware of trafficking animals and, and things like that. Uh, so the illegal uh, trafficking of wildlife is the fourth largest criminal industry uh, in the world behind drugs, guns and, and human trafficking. So, uh, you know, at a time when civilization has been brought to its knees by a small scaly anteater, I don't think there's ever uh, been a stronger message in history uh, that the protection of the natural world is, is what, what, what binds us together and our future as a civilization is dependent on, on our willingness to preserve biodiversity. Uh, so look, I'm, I'm optimistic that the heart of this situation is that the, the better the outcome uh, or the change will be on, on the other side of COVID. Um, you know, we, we have seen uh, definitely an, an upturn in, in, in various forms of poaching, one of them being bushmeat, uh, you know, people poaching for food, uh, but also dealing a lot with um, sale of elephant uh, ivory stockpiles. Uh, that our teams and our, our investigation units have been dealing with. So, yeah, there's definitely a, an, an increased amount of pressure that's been put on on these wilderness areas. Uh, and, and also you couple that with um, 
uh, a reduction in tourism, you know, an almost complete cessation of tourism, which is a, is a large funder of uh, conservation activities. So, yeah, look, it's a, it's a tough time. Uh, maybe for us, you know, we had to shift our, our entire strategies of how we, we raise funds, uh, not being able to get on a plane anymore and go and sit down and, and, and have the face-to-face conversations or, or give the lectures uh, you know, it does, you know, it forces you to change. And I think, you know, whilst uh, 2020 uh, was a tough year, it actually made us stronger as an organisation. Hmm. Uh, that's really, like, yeah, that's really humbling to hear that. Um, I mean, last week, um, the UN, there was a UN-backed report, I don't know if you've seen it, from Chatham House, um, and they were talking very clearly about how plant-based diets are crucial to saving yeah. global wildlife. Yeah, yeah, crucial to saving global wildlife. And I'm curious, like you draw that connection. Your like your uh, your group, the Akshinga people, they're all plant-based. They have a plant-based operation. You draw that relationship really clearly between like you know agriculture, plant-based living, um, and wildlife. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that. You know, there's two types of conservationists. There's vegans and those that don't want to take their work home. That's pretty much it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, right. you know, it's, it's, I mean, I, I got involved with conservation or grew my conservation interest, uh, through a love for the, for nature and, and the environment and, and, and animals and, uh, uh, the meat industry is responsible for the destruction of more, 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 uh, wilderness areas than anything else on the planet, either through, uh, a place to put animals or a place to grow food for, for animals. So, uh, um, and then, you know, responsible for the death of 100 billion animals a year. So whether you're in it for the, the conservation side or the animal side or, or both, um, the easiest way to, to, to protect both of those things is, is, is just don't stick the animals in the mouth. And, um, you know, we carry that through uh, into our operations. Um, we've got a, a, you know, 240 staff in Zimbabwe alone. Uh, a group of women doing one of the toughest jobs in one of the most remote and harshest locations, uh, in one of the toughest places on the planet, and uh, and they're thriving on it. They're doing it on a, on a plant-based diet. So uh, if they can do it out there and, and do the job that they're doing and, and the way they do it, um, then um, I don't think there's any excuse for anyone to, to at least not give it a shot. Mm, for sure. Um, I mean, one of the things about your story and your backstory, obviously you had like a, a series of moments and a series of encounters with wild animals, um, you know, suffering and in, 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 in pain. And you talk about the um, the bull elephant that you saw um, in particular, who had been, uh, you know, who had been poached. Um, I, a lot of people like haven't confronted death or confronted this type of um, visual, this such, such a massive animal in front of them suffering like this. Um, like, how would you think that the average person could would be able to connect animals, um, you know, living like wild animals or farmed animals and actually start to question them as food, like start to question what they regard as food. Start Googling, hey? Um, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, there, there, was a, there was a number of talks and, and videos, you know, in particular earthlings. Um, uh, Philip Wallen's talk, uh, Gary Yarovsky's talk, uh, you know, it's, it's not just visuals, it's it's information. And when we become armed with information, the, the bullshit excuses we create for ourselves to suit our own conveniences become harder and harder to to carry on with. And, um, you know, that was that was it for me. Uh, you know, we, um, you know, spent three, four years walking around the bush protecting one group of animals and coming home and throwing another, another group on the fire. And, um, you know, you, you come to realise that, the, the, you know, we, we all share, we all share one thing in common. Um, uh, and that is the capacity to suffer. Uh, and the only difference in the capacity to, su- to suffer between species is the difference we create in our own minds uh, and the bullshit excuses that we build around that to, to uh, help us sleep at night. And, you know, one of, one of the things I suppose about, uh, about me, I, I will say is it's, you know, I mean, I answer to no one other than myself and, uh, you know, when it comes to conscious decisions and, um, you know, there's only so much that I could bullshit myself. And, uh, and eventually, the, I mean, the truth is accumulative uh, and I couldn't put up with um, with what I was telling myself anymore for the simple fact that I, I like the taste of something or mm. did like the taste of something. So, yeah, it's, it, there's, a, there's enough stuff out there. I mean, get educated. You know, and, and I suppose, what, you know, I can understand people living in food deserts and people who come from from uh, you know various demographics that don't have access to, to, to a lot of choices. But, what, you know, what really grinds my axe is when you see, you know, people that are involved with conservation, you know, particularly on a scientific level, uh, or people that are, you know, in, in 
you know, in academia and, uh, you know, well-educated people that, that just put their head in the sand and they want to compartmentalise this part of their life uh, and not acknowledge uh, something that's very, not only very straightforward, but very well documented. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you see people who are vegan um, and climate scientists, for example, who go to conferences where it's just a room full of climate scientists and everybody's being served meat and there's not even a plant-based or a vegan option. It's like yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's sort of, um, yeah, pretty much refuse to go to those things uh, these days. Um, yeah. You know, it's, um, yeah, it, 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 it is crazy. You know, I watched a guy on stage get up at uh, the... Um, uh, what was it? It was a summit in New York. And get in this, give this passionate, passionate uh, uh, plea about um, you know, what's the what's the the dolphin that's going extinct there off the coast of California? And um, oh yeah, yeah. And um, I can't remember exactly. And he said, you know, there's only X amount of these things left, and uh, you know, he's crying and, and, and all this. It was very emotional actually. And then mm. you know, my buddy sticks his hand up. He goes, um, "Do you eat seafood?" And the guy's like, "Yeah, yeah, I do. Why?" You know, just um, it's uh, you know we 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 got to stop separating what's convenient and 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 um, you know start uh, pairing it up with 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 hard facts and, and the truth and take action as individuals. You know, we can't. You know, the biggest the biggest um, mistake I think we can make is to think that someone else is going to do it or that our individual efforts are, are not going to add up to something because they do. They have to. It's the only thing we got. <laughs> Well said. Um, I mean, you mentioned Google there as well, like Googling things like that was music to my ears because at Sentient Media, we do a lot of work to make sure our movement's message is visible. Um, and we know, basically, we work with writers to try and get articles placed in, you know, non-vegan mainstream outlets, etc, to try and get the message out there. Um, but we know that, like, reporting on wild animals and wild animal lives is much more appealing than reporting on farmed animal lives um yeah. do, you, do you usually get like the opportunity when you're doing because you get so, such good coverage you're in the guardian you're obviously you know in multiple documentaries like do you often get the chance to tie your work back to farmed animals and speciesism when you're talking to like more mainstream outlets well i have to it's all connected uh you know i mean i mean the, the areas that we uh, have been buying back you know we now well, have long-term leases on eight different uh, former trophy hunting areas that would otherwise have been turned into agricultural areas to graze cattle. Uh, you know, also the, the you know the less people eating bush meat, the uh, um, uh, you know the less uh, the less animals being killed, uh, the less people uh, or the more people in the communities that we can convince to, to rely more on a plant-based diet, the less health issues we have to deal with in those communities. Uh, you know, and in a lot of cases, social responsibility falls on the shoulders of, of conservationists because uh, there's there's no other option. I mean, just uh, you know, just uh, you know, in the last week alone, we've been. I mean, a few days ago, dealing with a young a young girl there who's you know burns to thirty percent of her body from boiling water. Another young boy has been crawling since he since he was uh, since he was born because he he, he was paralysed from the, the knees down. So he's got a wheelchair, you know. So these are, uh, but it's not just those sort of health issues we're talking about. But you know, when someone's having a heart attack or someone's got diabetes, and you know, there's, and there's nothing in the clinics. It falls back on us. So for us to try and encourage um, healthier living and, and plant based lifestyle uh, in countries um, and areas where getting access to, to medical help um, is very difficult. Um, prevention is the best cure. Yeah, like in, I, I've spent some time in West Africa and it's like a diabetes epidemic in places like the Gambia and, and Ghana. Um, yeah. is it this, like, I don't know which countries yeah. you're in in total, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, across Southern and East Africa, you know, we, we've got various projects or instructors that have been trained or deployed. Um, the majority of our Akashinga uh, focus is in Zimbabwe at the moment um, with an expansion um, towards the coastline happening uh, into maritime coastal conservation. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it seems so simple. Um, yeah, and you know, we, we have a program called Back to Black Roots, which is, uh, it's a four-stage program, first teaching our staff from a, a, an environmental, uh, uh, ethical and nutritional standpoint about why a plant-based diet matters, uh, teaching them how to grow their own food, prepare their own food, uh, then teaching their families, teaching the communities, and then uh, stage four is, is uh, building ambassadors. So, um, yeah, that program is, is going great. Uh, look, most, most of our staff um, maintain a plant-based diet away from work well, when they're at home. Not all of them do. 
Um, but when when they're at work, you know, we're a plant based organisation. Uh, we have a plant based policy. Um, you know, we literally just won't spend money on um, on animal products. Um, yeah, I like, I, I'm curious. There, there are so many. We, we talked about like environmentalists and you know climate scientists, etc., and this kind of um, inability to draw the connections. But at the same time, I'm kind of interested in your. You, you bridge a lot of gaps in like your own story and in the work that you're doing. Um, and I think like you know a lot of environmentalists or animal lovers perhaps are kind of um, painted as more peace loving and anti um, military, um, whereas you bring like this kind of connection of like bringing military solutions to these environmental problems um yeah look i mean don't be mistaken that we, we, we very much started off um that way because that's all i knew you know coming from iraq and you know my background special operations uh, uh working um with you know exclusively all male units uh um yeah very successful at what we did uh you know we, we eventually literally went out looking for bad guys and stopped them from doing what they did and uh, and then you know we, we sort of realised we're on a continent that's going to have two billion people by 2040, and and ultimately um, building bigger fences and, and and buying more guns is only going to go so far if you're having a sustained uh, long-term offensive against a local population that's going to you know continue to outnumber you. Uh, you know we you know we, we wanted to look at things differently, and I, I used to start my lectures by saying you know what we're doing is not the answer. It's not the answer. Think of us as like a paramedic trying to get this casualty to the operating table so we can come up with a better solution. And we don't know if, who's going to have the better solution, but we, we do need one. You know, for us, that, that solution came with um, uh, integrating women into what is a largely male-dominated industry where women are outnumbered by 100 to 1 on the front lines, unable to gain the access uh, to the experience they need to rise up and fulfil management positions uh, while other industries get ahead because uh, more women are getting into into those leadership positions and on the boards and into CEO positions. Um, conservation was being left behind and it was... Uh, you know, there's a, there's a number of, of different things that sort of fell into place for us um, uh, that made us, tr uh, you know, eventually trial uh, uh, an all-female anti-poaching unit, uh, which became the first armed all-female anti-poaching unit in the world uh, in Zimbabwe, 16 women we started off with. Obviously got 240 staff now as part of the project, um, but um, it, it shifted uh, just the, the, I mean, the way the women conduct themselves is a, is a number of key factors that, that make the program different and make it successful. But it shifted our way of looking at conservation from being inside a reserve, looking outwards, to being in the communities, looking in towards the reserve. Uh, you know, we, we essentially shifted our strategy on, on conservation. We put women's empowerment at the centre of that strategy. It gives us the greatest traction in community development and conservation became the byproduct of that. And that's, you know, that was largely driven by an overwhelming body of evidence that's telling us empowering women is the single greatest force for positive change in the world today. Um, is that why you set something up yourself, Rob? Because when you went in 2009, or was it earlier than that, when you went and joined a group that was already doing anti-poaching work, right? Um, is yeah. That like, is that why you decided to set up your own um, thing rather than kind of joining forces with what was already there? Uh, look, there was a number of reasons. Um, you know, I thought I could do things better. Um, I was being restricted in uh, how I was going about my business. Um, I was spending all my own money, so I needed to create a structure. Um, you know, I eventually did spend all my own money but through my own structure. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I needed to create a body that would, uh, you know, have some sort of sustainability uh, also, being a foreigner over here, uh, very hard to get a work permit. So, you know, a certain level of investment to be able to get that that work permit and that, and have some permanency here. Uh, so, there's a, a whole bunch of factors, and uh, yeah, absolutely no regrets. I'm glad I started I started when I was 29. You know, so at 41 now, I've made some monumental fuck ups, and uh, and seem to have got a lot of them out of the way and uh, have refined what we do to to these two key programs, Lead Ranger here, um, based out of Kenya, uh, and now Zimbabwe as well, um, with Lead Ranger, a new training facility being built down there. And then, of course, Akashinga, um, uh, helping protect at the moment uh, over one and a half million acres of, of African wilderness. Uh, we're on target, um, you know, with, with eight different uh, nature preserves, we're on target um, to have uh, hopefully 20 uh, former trophy hunting preserves uh, and 1,000 women uh, within the next five years.
Oh, it's just incredible work. Um, it's really great to hear. I mean, I've been following your story Thanks. throughout and like each time you you say something on one podcast or one interview, like the next year I'm listening, you're actually doing it <laughs> or achieving it and making making it happen. Thanks, it's amazing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the how much you must have learned about the process and, and what happens behind the scenes with poaching. Um, like he, how, how it, it does the demand come, you know, and then they target small communities to find people to to do the poaching and then the export. And then, you know, like what what does the actual process look like? Yeah, that's happening. In, that's happening. In, so you got to look at poaching two different things. One commercial. Uh, and that's usually your ivory, your tusk, your skins. Uh, bush meat on a, on a commercial level uh, and then subsistence poaching and that's people poaching to put food on the table so I mean that's sort of that's more ad hoc uh, commercial is, is much more structured uh, and in the case of ivory and, and horn is a commodity within organised crime syndicates alongside other, other commodities uh, and uh, you know so that's um, th- th- that comes from both a demand side and a supply side so you'll have people that will be out killing and then trying to feed that into the market and then you'll have uh, people that are placing orders uh, and those orders going into uh into syndicates that, that specialize in poaching so yeah and we we invest a lot into uh investigations work um i think uh last year alone at about, about 260 arrests with a conviction rate of over 86 percent wow um, so are you like are you finding that the people who are actually profiting from it are within the countries you're working in in Africa or are they the ones who are selling it out in Southeast Asia or what it's like, it's like drugs you know there's there's a there's a profit margin at each level of sale uh, you know as it moves through the supply chain uh, and obviously the, the higher it goes the the more it fetches um, you know we you know we our focus is is internal uh, within Africa. Uh, obviously, we get information relating to uh, transnational crime, and there's organisations such as Interpol that we pass that information on to. Mm, cool. Um, so I'm curious, like, I, I know, yeah, I'm curious about your levels of optimism for the future um, when it comes to stamping out poaching or to um, yeah, the future of what it looks like in Africa. <laughs> I've had my two years of fatalist attitude of like, fuck, where are we fucking going? What's going on? And that was a long time ago. So, uh, uh, yeah, look, um, I, we all sleep at night knowing the situation would be much worse if we weren't doing what we're doing. And I think that goes beyond conservation and anyone that's dealing with, uh, with a social issue or, or you know, animal issue. Um, yeah, we, 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 we can't change the world for everyone, but we can change the world for, for a lot of different species and a lot of different individuals. And I think that's, that's you know, I want to be able to sit back when, I'm a, when I've got a little bit more grey hair and, a, and uh, you know, my, with our rocking chair there on the, on, the, on the front veranda and just say, I helped, helped lead a team that played a part in holding on to as much of the natural world as possible and the animals that are in, 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 that, uh, in that world. And, uh, you know, who knows what the future looks like. But... Um, you know, I know that what we are doing is working. I know that the areas we protect are, are home to billions of different little species, you know, with there's lizards, snakes, birds, fish, trees, insects, elephants, rhinos, giraffe, all that sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, and that, you know, they're unaware of what's going on around them and, and the war that rages. But while there is a price on their head, there will be a job to be done. And I suppose that's what inspires me, not so not just, uh, you know, with people involved with, with the conservation movement, but with, with all our animal uh, and environmental movements. The job is never going to be finished, but uh, it doesn't mean that we slow down or, or, or relax. Uh, we just keep going. Yeah, dumb straight. Well said. Um, I, like, it's been great hearing about, obviously, what you've been doing. And like I said, I've been following what you've been doing over the years. And you achieved this massive goal in December of raising this million dollars. Um, what are, What's next? Like, what are the plans? Uh, so, yeah, we are um, currently training 110 new women. <clears throat> so um, getting them ready. I mean, the logistics of, of doing that, uh, we had to build a training facility. We put 15 instructors through that facility. Uh, yeah, you just... You know, I, mean, we, I mean, we are scaling essentially a small army of, 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 of women that will go out and protect millions and millions of acres. So, you know, there's a, there's a big machine that, that is underneath that uh, that, um, that makes that happen. So, you yeah, know, that requires funding and 
you know, it's a it's a global community of, of supporters that we have that, that make that a reality. And um, yeah, so yeah, the what next? Um, you know, scaling to to a new landscape. Um, so we 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 don't look at parks in isolation. We look at, at at groups of parks across larger landscapes, reopening traditional corridors and uh, traditional migration routes, uh, and that's what mm. we've been doing across the Zambezi Valley uh, very successfully, um, as well as our, our investigations work across the entire country um, to help break down those um, those syndicates. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, as we, we're moving into our next landscape now, um, which you know, is also going to be another significant investment, and then. Um, probably within five years be into our third landscape uh, you know on each one of those landscapes you know may have up to uh, you know essentially a, a dozen 15 different uh, reserves uh, or, or nature reserves or parks that, that make up the, the jigsaw puzzle well, not a lot then so. Uh, yeah well it's it's yeah, it's actually i mean it, like to be to be I mean, like people that are out there you know running your own organization or, or doing your own activism you know, it, it literally took us seven years to figure out what we do. Uh, you know, and that's a lot of trial and error and trying this, trying that. And then, um, yeah, 2017, when we got our lead ranger program here, up off the ground, train the trainer, uh, building instructors to go out and, and, and train rangers uh, within their own organisations. We've currently trained 44 instructors that uh, oversee 1,100 rangers and 14 million acres of, of African wilderness. You know, that, that you know, if, if that and expanding Akashinga is all I did for the rest of my life, then, uh, you know, I'd be, um, you know, be proud of uh, those achievements. Absolutely. Um, I'm super curious, like you spent so much of your time in the water, right? Like you were doing it from such a young age, you were out doing, you know, out diving and out collecting things um, from the sea. So it, do you have any ambition to do anything with marine life as well? It's happening right now. The proposals really? are being finalised. Yeah, the lawyers are doing the registrations. Um, speaking with multiple government departments. Uh, so yeah, it's um, yeah, we're looking at a, an area uh, essentially a million acres um, on land, seventy kilometres of coastline, and um, and then uh, an opportunity to uh, be working um, in one of the most biodiverse marine uh, areas on the planet. Wow. That's, That's awesome happening. to hear. That's yeah. great. So, yeah. Nice. Um, is there anything that you would like to leave? So, um, like, are there any other things that you'd like to leave our viewers with? Um, any, like, yeah. you know, obviously go watch the National Geographic documentary and Game Changers and things, but, um, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, of course, you know, if people want to learn more about the organisation, internationalantipoachingfoundation.org, and I'm sure you'll be able to post something up there. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm speaking to the, the converted here in, in, in uh, I suppose, with most people. But, you know, if I could say one thing, it's, it's keep having your conversations, uh, keep getting better at them. I know a lot of the time it feels like you're talking to a brick wall and beating your head against it uh, when you're trying to get your message across. But, the, uh, you know, it took me a long time uh, for the truth to get through. Um, but the, the, the truth is accumulative. And, and once the shutters come up, they never go down again. So don't give up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's great. And finally, um, we really want to talk to more people who are making an impact. Um, and yeah, Tanya tagged you and wondering who you'd like to tag. I would like to nominate um, my mentor, um, a chap called Philip Wallen, based out oh. of Australia. Um, so winner of the Order of Australia medal, um, uh, has sponsored uh uh, hundreds of charities, um, both animal and, and uh, humanitarian, uh, over the years, uh, funded, uh, owned and funded Kindness House, which was a free home for for hundreds of uh, animal and environmental charities um, over over a few decades. So he's um, definitely someone that has uh, given more than than most people I can imagine on this planet um, towards animals and humanity. That's awesome. Well, Philip, we're coming for you. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Damien, um, for all of your insight and all of your taking time out of your day to speak to us. Thank you. Have a great Is rest that? of your day.